You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. On today's show, we have Melody Perkins, who is the CEO and co-founder of Canva, an online design and publishing tool which makes graphic design simple for everyone. Since launching in 2013, Canva has grown to over 15 million users across 190 countries with more than 1 billion designs created. After hundreds of revisions to the Canva pitch deck, Melody has now raised more than $140 million and today's value of Canva is at 2.5 billion US, making Canva the second Australian startup to achieve unicorn status. This episode was a lot of fun. Melanie's smile and personality radiates throughout this interview. I know everyone at home is going to have as much fun and enjoyment listen to it as I did recording it. Enjoy. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Podcast with your host, Sean Flynn, who interviews famous entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and leaders in tech. Learn their secrets and see tomorrow's world today. Melly Perkins, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Thanks so much for having me. Now, Melly, give us a little history about the evolution from its start to what has become now. Yeah, absolutely. So I was at university and I was teaching design programs and they were super complicated. And I thought that in the future, they would all be online and collaborative and really simple. But at that point in time, I was 19 and I had no business experience or software experience or product experience or literally anything that would be relevant. So rather than trying to take on the entire world of design at that point in time, I decided to take on school yearbooks in Australia and turn my mom's living room into my office, ended up with printing presses there. My boyfriend became my co-founder um, and we set to work. And we did that for a number of years and grew profitably, grew internationally, and then wanted to take it to the much broader market of enabling everyone to design everything and set to work on that. It was sort of three years between pitching investors and actually a landing investment, a year of pitching engineers, trying to get them to join my team. And then a year of development. And then eventually in 2013, we launched, which was incredibly exciting to get Canva out into the world. Could you talk a little bit more about 2013 and that initial start? So we knew Canva was going to solve a really big problem that a lot of people face. So a lot of small businesses really struggle trying to create their marketing materials, their social media graphics, um, and they don't necessarily have the budget to create a lot of content. And now with the world becoming increasingly visual, Everyone's needing to create so much more visual content than ever before. And when Canva started, I saw that you want to be the world's most sophisticated and easy to use multi-user publishing system. And also that you wanted to take the entire design ecosystem, integrate it into one page and make it simple and accessible for everyone across the globe. When you were telling this to people, what was their initial reaction? So, funnily enough, that the first the first thing you said, um, the world's most sophisticated and easy to use uh, um, online publishing system. So, we in two thousand and eight, for my first company, we went in a um, it was called WA Inventor of the Year, Western Australian Inventor of the Year. So we're trying to sound very inventory. So that was where, where that uh, quite long title came from, the title of our pitch. And then when we were pitching for investors, we are explaining that we're going to take all these different ecosystems, all these different industries. So usually when a professional designer has to create a design, you have to go to go and spend a number of years using learning something like Photoshop. You then have to go to a stock photography library and a stock illustration library. You then have to go uh, to collect all the content from fonts and uh, stock layout sites. And then you have to collaborate over uh, email and Dropbox. And then finally you design, and then you have to use programs to go and prepare your design for web or print or videos or websites. And all these things are completely different. You're having to learn all and navigate all these different things online and offline. So we thought this was completely ridiculous and wanted to take it and all and integrate it into one page and make it accessible to the whole world. It was quite a large undertaking. And back in 2011, when we started pitching this to investors, I can now understand why most investors thought that we're a little bit crazy. Fortunately, we've we've gone and done exactly that. But I I do understand investors' apprehension when we were first pitching this idea. Now, if you went back in time and heard yourself pitch, would you have invested? I would have thought I was rather ambitious. And I, I think 
I, I think the reason why we eventually were able to attract investment was we knew the market intimately. So at that point in time, the lean startup was really popular. And the whole point, as I'm sure you know, like the lean startup is like, get something out there, iterate, see whether people like it. And we were coming in with a completely different mentality. We were like, there's this huge problem that people face that we want to solve. And in order to create an amazing user experience, we're going to have to go across all these different things that were completely separate previously. So I think that the thing that I care about most when I'm seeing other companies or in, in Canva itself was that we were out, setting out to solve a problem that affected a lot of people that a lot of people cared about and why it mattered. So most investors probably don't have a design background. I'm just guessing. So that was actually the exactly the first thing that we had to figure out was originally when we were starting to explain Canva, we sort of dived into our solution and the product that we were building and what we were doing. And then realized pretty quickly that investors exactly didn't necessarily do their own designs or even their own presentation. So they couldn't really relate to what we were talking about. And so then we had to completely flip our deck. And it became firstly explaining about, because people would say, oh, but isn't some other big company going to go and just do this themselves? And we had to explain how in the publishing industry, every every few decades, a new technology would be born that would completely change who was leading the market leader. Um, And that had happened four times in history and the market leader always changed every time there was this huge tectonic shift um, in technology and really helped them to understand the problem that people were faced. And then the size of the market, at that point in time, they may be a little more interested in our solution. And we continued to iterate on it time and time again. Every time an investor would come across with a problem, we'd have to come in and iterate on our deck again. So they'd be like, oh, you're the same as some other company. We're like, we're totally not. So then one of our early slides became a, the market landscape and showing where the huge gap was in the market. So how many times would you say you had to redo your pitch deck? And without Canva, how many hours do you think you spent redoing the deck? <laughs> um, literally hundreds. Every time an investor would meet with us, our strategy, rather than saying, hey, would you like to invest, would say, hey, give us some advice. And so we ended up with every time I'd have an investor meeting, we'd then iterate on my deck. And it meant that our deck ended up being really strong um, because it had so much iteration and it really meant that we had to become very confident with our strategy. And in fact, a lot of the pages in our deck, our original deck are still the pages that are in it today, except we've ticked a few of those things off now, which is quite nice rather than it all being very theoretical and philosophical, which is pretty cool to see. With building out the platform, the initial test, what was the feedback? How did you get the users to give you comments to reiterate to improve the product at the very initial stages? Yeah. So once we'd been, we'd been in development for about a year, building out the foundations of Canva. And then the first thing that we did was we used a site called usertesting.com where you can actually watch videos of people using your site, which was really interesting because we realized as soon as we did that, the people were really scared to click. They were scared to interact because people are told that design is a really hard thing that they can't do. I think that the first thing that we had to do was to add an element of playfulness. We spent a lot of time iterating on our onboarding flows and you had to do silly little things like change the color of a circle or put a hat on a monkey. These very small little challenges that it kind of switched the game from being, you know, I don't know how to use this to like, oh, I changed the color of the circle. I put a a hat on the monkey and it helped to build up people's confidence in what they were doing. So you actually used a gamification to introduce your product to the beta testers? Yeah, and, and to all of our users. I guess the problem that we, we, we realized early on was that people don't necessarily know they have a design need until they know how to design. If people came into our product and then it was going to be you know a month or so before they had a design need and then they had to learn how to use the product and then they would then promote it to a friend, we knew that that wasn't going to help Canva to spread very rapidly. So what we wanted to do was people came in, we gave them a design need because we gave them the five starter challenges. And then in a short period of time, they built up their confidence and then they were ready to share that with a friend because they would then also be more um, ready to take on design challenges as they came along. So we wanted that all to happen within the first few minutes of using the product, which certainly helped Canva to spread. And earlier you had mentioned that technology gets disrupted and you saw the shift. What was that shift? Absolutely. So back when we were starting out, everything was based on the desktop computer. 
despite the fact that the internet obviously had taken off in a very big way and you know Facebook was taking off at the time and it was like why are desktop why is design programs still desktop based why are they still so hard to use the other huge shift was when I was teaching design programs I was teaching design programs I was teaching Dreamweaver I was teaching video programs and all of these things had completely different UI which meant that people had to go and learn to navigate all these different systems And so what we wanted to do with Canva was to take all those different products that you might want to create and put them into one platform. So rather than having to learn all these different things, you could learn one product and then you could click a button and you could turn that presentation into a website or get it printed and delivered to your door, present it immediately or turn it into something that can be shared on your blog. So the whole point was that you could use one product to create anything it is that you want. It sounds like you're solving thousand problems at once. I, I would like to see that look on that in first investor's face when he's like, sees the sheet and just going, um, there's a hundred pain points you're tackling here. Yeah. I, I, I find it difficult to imagine what other people must have thought. Uh, <laughs> now, since Australia, you've now expanded. You have teams in Manila, China, and Australia. Can you talk about that team atmosphere and the culture and how actually having teams in all these different countries with such different cultures, how that kind of gels together, how that works for you? Yeah, absolutely. So our team actually speaks 40 languages natively within our team, which is pretty cool. So Canvas is used widely across the world. We're in 190 countries. We are in 100 languages. So it's been really critical for us to have that global viewpoint built into our DNA. And as we grow, we want to continue to have more and more people from across the globe being able to bring those local uh, vantage points. So we've got, yeah, our team is based in Sydney, the Philippines, and last year we launched in China as well. And I think it's been really awesome to have such a global viewpoint. One of the things that we did early on was we launched a lot of Roman languages because they were kind of the easier languages for us to get into. Then we tackled some of the harder languages that had different scripts and alphabets. And then last year, we tackled a lot of the hard languages. So we launched in um, China, where we had to have, obviously, our servers based there. We had to build up an amazing team there. And we also launched in right-to-left languages, so things like Arabic and Hebrew and Urdu, which obviously was a huge engineering effort. But our goal right from the start was to empower the whole world to design. And when we say the whole world, we literally mean everyone, which meant that it was really critical to have a global viewpoint from our team, from the way we localize our product. And now we're focusing really on um, providing a a heavily localized experience. So ensuring that not only do we have some fonts available, we have a huge wide variation of fonts available, that our templates are localized, that people can pay in their local currency using local payment methods. So we're just getting deeper and deeper into the localized experience. That's amazing, this world reach and, and view from the beginning. So many companies have had challenges entering the China market, but yours seems to be smooth going going through the motion like it's nothing. Could you talk a little bit about the preparation to enter China and if there's been any pivots or major roadblock in this journey? Yeah, I think because we've had such a global viewpoint from the start, when you look, launch in China, you can't just do basic localization as in just translating the language. We really had to localize the product heavily. So we partnered with the biggest stock photography site in China. We also partnered with the biggest font foundry over there. We've had to ensure that we connected with their local apps, so things like Weibo and WePay. So we've really had to ensure we've had a very localized experience, which has been critical um, to ensure that people in China are having a great experience. And what is a Canva season opener? Yeah. (laughs) So in the early days, every Friday we'd get up and everyone would say that what they've been working on. Then our company grew a little too much for that and it was starting to take a little too long. Every team would get up and present what they're working on. But then that started to take too long. And then we needed, we started doing it every month and then we're like, okay, this is getting ridiculous. And so what we now have to do is every season, so like literally autumn, winter, spring, summer, the teams get up and they present the big goals that they're working on. It's actually crazy in the season opener week, so much work gets launched. It's a lot of fun. And it also means that you can probably tell we're doing quite a lot as a company. And so ensuring that everyone has context and everything that's going on across the company is also really critical. And so that's exactly what happens at Season Opener. And they're also a lot of fun. So we often have a theme and a lot of people get into the theme quite heavily. It's a little bit of fun to show off everyone's creativity as well. 
So these season openers, is it localized to each office or do the offices get together and actually collaborate maybe online or work together to create? We have a season opener here in Sydney and one in Manila and our China team is comparatively pretty small right now. So they often come and join our other season openers, but they also do their own um, localized season opener as well. So um, a little bit of a little bit of both. Melody, now with locations all around the world, tell me a little bit about the atmosphere in Canva, the working environment. What's the hustle and bustle daily life like? Yeah, something that we have spent a lot of time on is ensuring that right from the start, we wanted to ensure that Canva was a place that we wanted to work at. And so every decision that we've made has really been founded around that. And so what I wanted to do was to ensure that at Canva, we always had lunch together. And so even in our earliest days um, with our first company, we'd always have lunch together as a team. And that's something that we've continued in each of our offices, which is a really nice tradition because it means you get to know people outside your the immediate people you're working with. And you also get to know people as humans as well, which is really lovely. We're 600 people now. So we have been growing very rapidly. We've been doubling each year and we're hiring internationally. So we've got people from all over the world joining Canva. We've got a lot of people from the US who've um, actually even moved over here. Um, Sydney's an amazing place to live. Now with that massive growth, I'm guessing people there are working seven days a week. 20-hour days, probably someone's hitting them with a stick to make them keep typing. What, what's the atmosphere like in the building? <laughs> Quite the contrary. We've had a really strong focus on ensuring that people actually have a life outside work as well. And so people work flexi time here. Um, there's everything from like nails club to skateboard club to book club to board game club to every sort of, every sort of club under the sun which really helps pay um, dogs club. I joined that one recently. Um, <laughs> the, all sorts of different things. And they're actually enjoying their life as well. And then your headquarters in Sydney, Australia. Why not move to Silicon Valley? In our early days, investors said exactly that. In fact, a lot of investors didn't invest because of that very reason. I think that it worked out very fortuitously. Our CTO and our co-founder, Cam, and uh, Cam's our co-founder and Dave's our CTO, They both came from Google Wave, which was based here in Sydney, which meant that we were able to attract a really strong tech team and get a really strong tech foundations here. We're also able to build a really strong team. And because of that foundation, it's really meant that we've been able to attract people from all over the world here in in Australia. I'm quite glad that I'm not in Silicon Valley. I've heard there's some crazy retention rate of like 15 months or something for for um, an engineer. I don't know how people build companies if that is the actual retention rate. We're very lucky to have a lot of people here at Canva that have been here for years, even though we're growing really rapidly. It's really lovely to have have such amazing people around who are loyal and really trying to build this thing. I got to ask again, it was mentioned earlier when you said you're with investors and they would say, well, why can't a bigger company just come and compete with you? Is that a fear that you have now? And if so, what's stopping the competition? I think one of the most critical things for any company is to focus on what you're doing and what your customers and what they need. And I remember in the early days, investors would say like, oh, you're so, so-and-so is just going to go and completely do it. And I think that why, what we said then, and I still believe now, is that it's, we were just completely reinventing everything from the monetization model to the way like people don't pay for the software, they pay for the ingredients, they pay for it because they want to increase their productivity. Like there's just so many ways that we're rethinking the whole industry. And it's also quite technically complicated what we're doing. So there's a few things that we thought would enable us to have, have, have a go at this market. And Melody, Canva just announced its acquisition of Pexel and Pixabay. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. When someone's creating a design, it's absolutely critical that they have awesome ingredients. So we wanted to ensure that people had amazing photography, amazing illustrations, amazing templates. And so with Pexels and Pixabay, they were two of the world's largest stock photography uh, free sites in the world. So many contributors, I think it's 200,000 contributors from across the globe. And so we really wanted to ensure, um, as I've mentioned with our global focus, that we have these amazing, this amazing photography from such an amazing community across the globe. And so we're incredibly excited to be now partnered with and to have acquired these companies, to be able to have all of their amazing photography exposed to our community. And also, 
Canva has quite a few partnerships, one including integration with Dropbox. Is the expansion goals for Canva more acquiring companies or more partnering? A little column A, a little column B. So I think it's really important that Canva fits into everyone's workflow. So our whole point of Canva is to make everyone's work way easier. And so it's really important that people can pull in all of the ingredients that they want to be able to access and use in their designs and not have to leave Canva. And then the other thing is that we want people to be able to take their design to wherever they want it to go with just one click. And so that's exactly why partnerships like Dropbox are really important. And we'll be continuing to do a lot more in, in that space over the years to come. And with Canva acquiring other companies, there's probably been a time in the past, especially with this amazing growth of companies wanting to acquire you. Have you ever had investors or that kind of push you in that direction? Or what are your thoughts of that? Yeah, I think because we have had such a big vision right from the start, and we feel like we have done literally 1% what's possible, there's actually still things in our deck from years gone by that haven't been done yet. Investors haven't been pushing us to sell in any way whatsoever. I think investors that have invested in Canva really believe in what we can achieve and in our future roadmap and vision. So yeah, we've got a lot to do. Can you tell us a few of these things that are in this amazing pitch deck that I'm really curious about because something tells me it's it's a treasure map that are going to be accomplished, that are next steps? Yeah, I can, I can touch on a couple of things. So one of the things right from the start we realize that large companies and large enterprises have a lot of problems creating designs. So often the sales team, for example, gets completely neglected by the design team because the design team are focused on all of the above the line things or the, you know, the high value marketing material. The sales team needs to create a lot of amazing content, creating custom pitch decks. The social media team needs to create lots and lots of social media content every single day. The exec team or actually a lot of the organization needs to be creating lots of presentations. And so it's really hard for brand managers to ensure that their brand is consistent across all of these channels. Um, and so we knew this right from the start, that Canva would be able to have a significant role to play in large companies and enterprises. And so that's something that we're really excited to be launching in the, in the not too distant future and to, be, to really enable companies to have that efficiency. They shouldn't have to be sending PDFs across the organization, going backwards and forwards, making markups. They should be able to create amazing templates that then the rest of the organization can use and to know and feel confident that they're going to be staying on brand. So that's one of the things that we're really excited about and it's coming in the not too distant future. Another thing I can touch on is presentation. So we think that presentations have been so outdated. As the web has been, incre- has been growing and everything's becoming dynamic and um, people are being able to embed YouTube videos and tweets and Facebook posts and all those sorts of things on websites, But I guess like our overarching mission is to enable everyone to design anything and publish anywhere. And when we mean anything, we we literally mean anything. So you can probably tell there's quite a lot to happen in that space yet. And going back to the company, it's my understanding that Canva is actually profitable. Isn't that not supposed to happen to a unicorn company? (laughs) I know. You'd think that, right? I think because we're solving a problem that so many people care about, I think that's really helped us to grow because our our product is free. And that's also been another really critical part of Canva's story is that we wanted to ensure that we have a valuable free product that anyone in the world can access, regardless of income, regardless of how much you make or where in the world you live. We wanted to ensure that everyone can access it. And so the fact that we're profitable is actually what you can do with Canva. You can purchase $1 images. So you can purchase $1 images. You can purchase $1 illustrations. And that was a payment stream that we had right from the start. And then you can also upgrade to increase your productivity. We have a product called Canva Pro. And so you can save your color palettes and logos and fonts and arrange your things in folders and you can click a button and turn your design into all sorts of different formats for social media. So all these sorts of things that people want to do to increase their productivity, they can do with Canva Pro. And so I guess that's why. Oh, and you can also print your design. So in 44 countries, you can click print and your design can get delivered to your door. And now in the US, you can click print and you can get your design printed on the T-shirt, which is pretty great for company swag. So the whole point of Canva is that we have a really valuable free product. But then when you want to pay, you can to increase your productivity or to get your design physically printed. Now, with that pricing model, that the freemium, are you seeing it really taking hold in these emerging countries and just 
the user base there growing rapidly because of the options more or less that they have and they can still use everything? Design is just such a universal problem. It's universal across every industry. Teachers are needing to create more content. Marketing managers, small businesses, startups, everyone's needing to create lots and lots of visual content. And that's not a need that's specific to a certain country. It's not a need that's specific to a certain age or demographic. It's, it's very universal, which I think is why we've been experiencing so much growth. Well, Melody, thank you for your time today on Silicon Valley. Is there any way that people can find out more information about you or Canva? What would you recommend them visiting or, or doing? Well, on Instagram, I have three posts, so I'm not sure that that's going to be that exciting for anyone, um, but I, I tweet a bit generally there, but Canva, just check it out on canva.com. Great. We'll have that link in the show notes. And Melody, thank you for your time today. And we look forward to having you on the show again in the future and great success for step one and step two of your plan. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Silicon Valley podcast. To access our resources, visit us at the Silicon Valley podcast.com and follow our host on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Sean Flynn SV. This show is for entertainment purposes only and is licensed by the Investors Podcast Network. Before making any decisions, consult a professional.